Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, class. And I'm once again uh, delighted to be joining with you. And I hope you're keeping extremely safe. And uh, I also want to, I'm sure that you are able to catch up with your submission of the assignment that most of you did mention yesterday. Okay. So far, so good. It's been moving on well. I can see Danny Champion, Ivy, Ruth, Chigombe, okay, and uh, Amy, you're all welcome. And that is uh, as we did yesterday. Please uh, get connected, have your writing material with you, your pen and your paper. And uh, as much as you can, never keep the material for too long. After a particular class, I think it's it's um, it's good that you go through. And, um, let's have uh, let's have a great class today. Okay. Uh, keep ap apologizing for sometimes the internet network disturbs here as it disturbs wherever you are. So I understand. And uh, that's why I've, uh, I, I've been keeping the, the, the PowerPoint presentation online. So as much as you can, make sure you subscribe, okay? Yesterday, before I started my lecture, I, I tried to, to bring us to bear and to make you understand that it is important that you leave okay be alive okay it is important that you be ever writing you will do stay alive that's the zeal the energy to move on and sometimes routine can be so annoying routine can sap, routine can sap energy from you okay and you might have been engaging in a routine get up in the morning do chores study a little bit, do one of a few things, get by, do chores. And so the routine can sap. Huh? But if you are one of those people, I it could be that you're treating your prayer life lightly, okay? Funny enough or quite uh, thinking, why must he be saying this? Of, okay, there's a possibility, wh whatever you believe in, whoever you believe in, but there is a possibility that you could be treating your prayer life poorly. Because when you treat your prayer life poorly, you lose the energy, you lose the flavor for living, you lose the zest, you lose the energy, okay? You lose the inspiration. Even sometimes you know that at the starting of the week, you are so inspired, probably maybe you had a service or whatever, for whatever, or maybe on a Saturday you had a service or on a Sunday, and if by Wednesday, Thursday, you're already feeling so weak, even to do common things, you are pathetic, even the joy is withered from you. That's one of the things which I make a choice to always pray. My okay, when he wants to deal with you, he deals first with your prayer life. Okay, so one of the things which you would, I am not teaching you how to pray, I'm just telling you to always pray. It's very important, it's very vital. It will steer you more inspired and how energized and how hopeful you become. Many, many students are losing hope. Even many losing hope, even within this pandemic, fear is creeping, the, on, there is uncertainty. How long will this last? But please, if you want to stay relevant, you want to stay motivated, you want to stay inspired, please pray, pray, choose to pray, choose to pray. It is very hard. It is very hard to see a prayerful person who isn't alive. I told you yesterday how to be alive. One of the tested ways is to be prayerful, okay? It doesn't matter the mountain you are experiencing, the mountain kind of pray, okay? No one can be prayerful and, and losing, okay? No. And losing. So consider that today, okay? Regardless of what you may be going through, give your prayer life some serious priority. It's not just I get up in the morning, I pray in the evening. I, no, let it be the effervescence of your meditations. Let it be the effervescence of your spirit. It's something you should do. Let it be a constant meditation. Let your spirit be a glue. Okay? Life is spiritual. When you start feeling weak, you start feeling 
low, you start feeling unmotivated, know that your spirit is weak. Know that your spirit has lost energy. Know that your spirit has lost the flavor. So it is a manifestation of what is happening to your spirit that is happening to your body. Okay, please, if you want to stay a glue, you want to stay active, you want to stay relevant, make sure you pray. Make sure you pray. It may not be easy. It may not be an easy step, but then you have to. Because you may be experiencing some things that may drag you away from doing this. The one thing you need to do, do it all the same. Okay? Do it all the same. Because that's the only way you can go through it. You may be experiencing the darkest times of your life. You may be down the valley. Or you may be sleeping. You may be sliding. You may be crawling. But for you to want to stand and to wake and to walk and to run and to fly to keep your prayer life energetic. Don't play with it. Live your life. If you want to stay a gloom, make sure, please, you pray. Many good things just hang in the air. Things are happening. You, you just see there are blessings. There are things you just, you can't just let your hand to them. But please, start to energize your prayer life. Come alive again. And there are a number of ways, probably maybe for the past time you've not been praying, for the past time you've not been trying to engage in this, there are a number of ways you can stir up yourself into prayer and revamp your prayer life. One of them is fellowship with the word. Okay, fellowship with the word. Okay, have a fellowship time with the word. Okay, if you, if you, if you've been stirred by the spirit to, to pray in the spirit, just as it's mentioned in First Corinthians, it's mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, and it's mentioned in Mark 16, from 16 to 18, you can flavor your life with it, okay? Please, don't lose out. These are trying times. These are tough moments, okay? We are in the last minutes of the last days, okay? We are in the last minutes of the last days. You can't afford to lose out of it, okay? You can't afford to lose out of it, okay? Don't just plan to st just start doing it. And then another thing, create an atmosphere. Play something, spirit-lifting music, spirit-lifting songs. Just sing along, okay? It's, it's, it, you can't surround yourself with carnal music and expect to live a, a buoyant spiritual life. Life is spiritual. That's why I don't care that I'm using this platform to talk. You may think you're not a Christian, but you can't go out of this path. You cannot deny the fact that life is spiritual. If you do not influence your spirit, right or wrong, you can't influence your life. You need the energy to run with this life. Okay, you need that energy. And then you need to create an atmosphere to listening to the word. Spend some time with your Bible. Listen to, the, to your pastor's messages. You go to church or online or what. You take notes. Come look at them. It is very vital. Please, you have to do that. And surround yourself with friends that can motivate you. Surround yourself with people that will motivate you to kick back to life. Okay, please. It's, it's important. Okay, I hope that... Uh, so that uh, put it that we should speak just with. okay. Stay alive. Do not be selfish with your life. Do not be self-centered. Stay alive. Okay. Stay alive. Stay alive. You can't afford not to stay alive. And the way to stay alive is to, is to stir up your spirit. Once you start feeling in your body, know that your, your spirit is already getting sick. Stay alive. Okay, and exams are coming soon. Okay, we are entering to the phase of assessments. Okay, you will need all the mindset, you will need all the energy, all the focus, all the guidance to be able to be useful. Okay, and so much ado about that, but please, I, I want to I want to hope that this would have inspired somebody not to give up, not to feel down. Whether you feel down, whether whether conscious or unconscious, whether by your own deliberate acts or by what kind of peace, pray yourself through. Oh yes, pray yourself through. Okay. Once again, thank you and thank you again. Okay. Thank you and thank you again for always giving me the opportunity to be able to influence your life. Uh, both with the substance of our discussions on physiology and other things, okay? Not is this honor taken no man to himself. Okay, so yesterday we introduced and we started with uh, gastrointestinal physiology. We did a few introductions and we looked at the, the, the structure of the GIT, okay? And so now we started yesterday, we talked about salivary secretion, okay? And we looked at saliva is secreted from three, from several grounds, majorly from uh, the parotid, from the submandibular, from the 
uh, from the sublingual, and then we, talk, we also mentioned that it's secreted from the von Ebner's gland, and a few glands that are scattered to the buccal cavity. Okay, and this saliva in the in the salivary glands we have the acina cells, okay, or the acina, and we have, this acina contains two types two types of cells. We have the we have the serous cells and have the mucous cells. The serous cells secrete uh, watery secretions, watery saliva that is rich in the enzyme tylene, and why the mucus secretes what a thick visit. A secretion that is rich in mucin, and we said mucin is a glycoprotein which, when dissolved in water, gives us mucus. And we mentioned about the percentage contribution to saliva, and we talked about the innervation of the salivary glands. We talked about the, the sympathetic nerves that arise from the lateral horn cells of the upper two thoracic vertebrae. And this, um, from here. They relay in the superior cervical ganglion, and from this postganglionic noradrenergic postganglionic fibers supply the submandibular and the and the sublingual glands. Okay, and then we said sympathetic stimulation produces leak, a little secretion, also causes vasoconstriction and causes contraction of the myoepithelial cells. Okay, causes contraction of what? the myoepithelial cells. Then we talked about the parasympathetic stimulation, and we said the submandibular and the sublingual glands are supplied by a branch from the fascia nerve called the coda tympani, which arises from the superior salivatory nucleus in the lower pons, and then it relays in the submandibular ganglion from which, and then on the other hand, the parotid gland is supplied by a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve, the uh, cranial nerve, um, nine, and uh, which is called the lesser, the lesser superficial petrosa nerve. Okay, and which this uh, and it arises from the inferior salivary nuclei in the upper medulla. Okay, and it relates in the otic ganglion, and then from the otic ganglion, the postganglionic fibers now supply the the otic gland. And we said parasympathetic stimulation produces two main effects, profuse uh, secretion of watery saliva, and then we also said it also brings about marked vasodilation, okay? And then we were about ending at the point where we mentioned produces not only parasympathetic, please note this, okay? Note this. We said stimulation of the superior and the inferior salivary nuclei produces not only parasympathetic effects but also sympathetic effects why because they also charge impulses that stimulate the lateral horn cells in the spinal cord okay. questions they come inside but as much as you can be polite uh, manifest the ethics on the comment section so that i don't keep going over and over okay okay thank you for that so I said, stimulation of the superior and the inferior salivary nuclei produces not only parasympathetic effects, but also sympathetic effects. Why? Because impulses discharged from, 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 from this nuclei stimulate the lateral horn cells. Remember we said the sympathetic uh, nerves arise from the lateral horn cells of the upper two thoracic segments. Okay? From the upper two thoracic segments. <laughs> Okay. Now there is uh, what we also call because of this, because of this uh, effect of the impulses arising from the um, the superior and the inferior salivary nuclei, because of the, in, the 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 influence they have on the lateral horn cells, when during parasympathetic stimulation there is an augmented salivary secretion. Okay, now how? Sympathetic stimulation of the salivary glands after parasympathetic stimulation produces what? Augmented secretion of saliva. Okay, now because what? Remember, the parasympathetic activation or outflow sends impulses to the lateral horn cells, which is sympathetic outflow to the salivary glands. Okay, so this is due to sensitization of the glands to sympathetic stimulation by the preceding parasympathetic stimulation. So, if we have a sympathetic stimulation 
of the salivary glands after parasympathetic stimulation will have an augmented sympathetic stimulation after parasympathetic stimulation would be would increase because the parasympathetic stimulation had sensitized the salivary they, they had the salivary glands to sympathetic stimulation okay so that co the concept is called what augmented saliva data then we also have what we call paralytic salivary secretion paralytic salivary secretion okay now if you have if you section the cord the cordial tympani that means if you cut the cordial tympani nerve okay there will be a marked decrease in salivary secretion there will be a marked decrease in salivary secretion from the submandibular gland remember we said the submandibular gland and the what and the the sub the sublingual glands okay so if you section if you cut the collar tympani nerve, there'll be a marked decrease in salivary secretion from the submandibular gland. Why? Why, do, why are we so stressful about the submandibular Remember, the submandibular gland produces 70% of the saliva. So what happened? Then once this nerve is sectioned, one day after that, a little secretion of the saliva starts. Okay, they will have little secretion of the saliva start and increases gradually for about uh, six to seven days. And is maintained for about six weeks. Okay, this secretion is called what? Paralytic secretion. Paralytic secretion, and it is believed to be due to what? Hypersensitivity of the gland. Remember, you have cut this the collar tympani, which is the branch of the facial nerve that supplies what? That supplies the submandibular and the sublingual gland, and the submandibular gland produces about seventy percent. Okay. Okay, the parotid produces about 20, the sublingual produces about 5, and then the von Ebner's and other glands produce about 5%. So if you cut the cutter tympani, the salivary production due to the submandibular gland will reduce. Okay, so what is the explanation of this? It is, and we said a day after that, you will start seeing salivary secretion, and then which will continue and, opt, and is optimal about uh, on the seventh day, and then it's maintained for about six weeks. What is the reason for this? It's about what hypersensitivity of the gland. Okay, there is this law that is called the law of denervation hypersensitivity. The law of denervation hypersensitivity. Okay, the law of what denervation? The law of denervation. Okay, and we call it denervation what hypersensitivity. I hope uh, I spelled it well. Okay, denervation hypersensitivity. Okay, that, that means what? A denervation sensitive, okay? If you cut the cutter tympani, the submandibular gland becomes hypersensitive to the neurotransmitter that was released oh, by the cutter tympani, okay? But it was found that, and the, neuro, the neurotransmitter that is released by the cutter tympani is acetylcholine. Okay, it's acetylcholine. But by an unknown mechanism, it was found that um, cholinergic blockers or anticholinergic drops do not stop this secretion. Then, then, therefore, there should be another mechanism. But it was found that noradrenergic blockers, hmm, noradrenergic blockers decrease what? This secretion, okay? Noradrenergic blockers decrease this secretion. Therefore, such secretion is due to increased sensitivity of the gland to adrenaline and not to what, not to our acetylcholine, not to acetylcholine. Okay. Then we have we had now we've talked about augmented salivary secretion. We we've looked briefly at paralytic salivary secretion, and then we want to talk about the mechanism of salivary secretion. What is the mechanism by which saliva is secreted? Okay. Salivary secretion passes through three phases. Salivary secretion passes through three phases. We have the cephalic phase, before food enters the mouth. We have the buccal phase, while food is in the mouth. And we have what? We have the gas through which salivary secretion passes. We have, of course, before food enters the gastrointestinal phase, which occurs after the food is swallowed. Okay, after the food has been swallowed. So salivary secretion passes through three phases, okay? And now we said, uh, Salivary secretion should occur rapidly, isn't it? 
Now, when we were talking about regulation, general regulation of gastrointestinal activities, uh, uh, Prince Bualia, please come again on the faces, okay? He said, I said salivary secretion passes through three phases, okay? The first phase is the cephalic, okay? Cephalic. Cephalic, that has to do with the what? The head, okay? Cephalic, so to speak. Then we have buccal phase, buccal phase, which occurs when food enters the mouth. Cephalic phase occurs before food reaches the mouth, before food enters the mouth. The buccal phase occurs when food is in the mouth, and the gastrointestinal phase occurs uh, when food is swallowed. Okay? And when we are talking about um, regulation of gastrointestinal functions, we said we have two regulations the nervous regulation and the endocrine regulation. It takes a little while, right? And salivary secretion should occur rapidly because food normally stays in the buccal cavity for just a limited time. I'm sure you ate this morning or probably maybe you've eaten before this lecture. How long did you chew your food? I can, I can guarantee you there are some of you who don't even remember chewing food, right? That's to tell you what the speed at which food, the, 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 the duration at which food stays in your mouth is not much. Okay, the duration at which food stays in your mouth is not much. Okay, so salivary secretion, uh, secretion should be rapid because what food doesn't stay long in the in the in the mouth. Okay, and so salivary secretion is under nervous control. Okay, it's under nervous control only. Okay, it's under nervous control only. Why? Because food. Doesn't stay long in the mouth, and so whatever be the mechanism for its, for the production of saliva should be rapid. Okay. So if I ask you, why is there no hormonal regulation of saliva circulation or saliva secretion, you may have an idea. And the the release of saliva is or the secretion of saliva is controlled through two types of reflexes. We have the conditioned and the unconditioned reflexes. Okay, we have the conditioned and the unconditioned reflexes. So let's look at the conditioned reflexes and the unconditioned reflexes. Remember, salivary secretion passes through three phases. Okay, the cephalic, the buccal, and the gastrointestinal. It passes through three phases, the cephalic, the buccal and what and the gastrointestinal phases we have the conditioned and the unconditioned reflexes okay okay we say conditioned reflexes or what psychic reflexes okay so the conditioned reflexes these are responsible for the cephalic phase of salivary secretion okay they are responsible for what for the cephalic phase of salivary secretion conditioned so you, you condition yourself, you train yourself, okay? These reflexes are not inherent, they're not inborn. They are learned and they are trained, okay? They are acquired reflexes, okay? They are acquired reflexes that are developed through learning and training. And, and therefore, since they, uh, they, they are developed through learning and training, they require an intact cerebral cortex, okay? They require an intact cerebral cortex because the areas, the centers for their integration are are uh, within the cortex, within the cerebral cortex, okay? And so seeing food, smelling food, hearing about food, or even thinking of food stimulates salivation. Of course, you are, you are, you are quite familiar with that, right? Okay, you are quite familiar with that. So seeing food, smelling food, thinking about food, Okay, or even hearing about food. Okay, so of these ones, which ones, which one do you think should be the most potent? Smelling food, hearing food, hearing about food. Okay, thinking about food. Which one do you think should be the most potent? Of course, you thought right. Seeing food. Okay, seeing. That's why when you go to a restaurant, the menu they give to you has pictures. Okay, has what? Has pictures, okay? But of course, it could be discussed at, at different levels for us to see. But then, so what is the mechanism of the conditioned reflexes? Let's take the side of food, for example. 
When you see food, they excite the receptors, the visual receptors in the eye. Mm? They excite what? The visual receptors in the eye, from which impulses are transported by afferent nerve fibers in the optic nerve. Okay? So when you see food, the visual receptors in the eye are, are stimulated. Then impulses are generated in the retinal epithelium and what the 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 response the, the information so the information is picked up via the optic nerve through the optic tract to the visual center in the occipital loop of the cerebral cortex okay so these impulses that are picked up from the retin retinal epithelium and through the optic nerve to the optic tract past the optic chiasma and then to the visual cortex in the occipital loop and from there Information now, the response now stimulates the salivary nucleus, which is present in the pons and in the medulla oblongata. So the salivary nucleus is, or the salivary nuclei are present in the brainstem. Okay, this is the remember today I was trying to introduce you about the nervous system. I told you about the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And I said the central nervous system is made of the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is made of the cerebral cortex. The brain is part of the cerebral cortex, and beneath the cortex will have other important structures like the hypothalamus, the basal ganglia, the, the thalamus, the hippocampus. And so then we have the brain stem, okay, the brain stem, which is the pons, the medulla, and the, the pons, we have the, 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 the midbrain, sorry, the pons, the medulla, and then the medulla continues as the spinal cord when it passes through the foramen magnum. Of the, at the base of the skull. So we have the, that's the brain, so we have the brain stem. Okay, so the brain stem is made up of what? The midbrain, the pons, and the medulla of longata. Okay, so when we have uh, integration of information in the visual cortex, in the occipital lobe, information is uh, sent to the salivary nuclei in the brain stem, and from there, which is now by efferent parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve fibers to the salivary to the salivary glands to produce what to produce uh, salivary secretions. Okay, so that is a conditioned reflex. That's the mechanism of the conditioned reflex. Remember, these reflex they are not inherent. They are acquired reflexes through training and through learning. Okay, they are acquired through training and through what through learning. That means it requires what an intact cerebral cortex. Okay, and we said we have these as smelling. Okay, these are stimuli. These are we have smelling, hearing, thinking, or seeing food. I think it. And we took, for example, the the, the, the case of seeing food. The visual receptors are what are stimulated. Okay, and impulses are transmitted via optic nerves to optic tracts to the optic the chiasma, and then to the what. To the, to the visual cortex, okay? From the information goes to the brainstem and uh, efferent impulses are picked up by parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve fibers that stimulate what? That now stimulate the salivary glands to produce salivary secretion, okay? To produce salivary The The Russian uh, physiologist that um, experimented on dogs and he was able to experiment this conditioning of behavior uh, using the dog and um, he he combined uh, giving um, food to the dogs that means he will ring a bell and when he rings a bell he, he presents the food so the bell was indicating that food is available to, onto the dog and so when there was an, a, a ringing of the bell and the presentation of food there was salivation Okay, so after a while, after the dog was trained and the dog learned this, he decided not to present food, but only to ring the bell. And then, on, then this bell ringing was what? Also stimulated salivary secretion because the dog had associated ringing of the bell to food. And that provoked what salivation. So that is what's conditioning. The dog was conditioned. Okay. Okay, so let's look at unconditioned reflexes. Okay, on the, we said the conditional reflexes are responsible for the cephalic phase of salivary secretion. The unconditioned reflexes are responsible for the buccal phase. Okay, the unconditioned reflexes are responsible for the buccal phase of salivary secretion. Okay, they are inherent. 
Okay, they are inherent, they are inborn reflexes. You don't need to learn them, you don't need to, to, to be trained, and therefore you don't even need an intact cerebral cortex. Okay, can you imagine that? Remember what we talk about Vika is when the food and is vegetative, once food enters your mouth, somehow you are you what you will salivate. Actually, and as, to an extent, to a large extent, as I'm even talking to some of you, some of you are already saliv uh, salivating because of the mental visualization of it. So introducing food into the buccal cavity, especially if the food is sour, okay, if the food is sour, okay, or mechanical uh, stimulation of the buccal cavity plating, okay, and they are manipulating with, um, with, with, with your teeth or with uh, structures within your buccal cavity, it stimulates salivary secretion, and you can think of others, okay? You can think of others. So this leads to what, and how does it happen? This act occurs by what? This occurs due to stimulation of the test buds, okay? From which impulses arise and are transported via afferent nerve fibers in the seventh and the ninth cranial nerves. So what happens when food enters the mouth, okay? We'll talk about, I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to be able to reach there in special senses, but of course, the food is broken down, is dissolved, it has uh, chemicals, and there are different test boards. So there are test boards which uh, have receptors for different types of cues, okay? So the, the test boards, the test receptors, which are the test boards are stimulated, okay? And then impulses are transmitted through afferent, the ninth cranial nerve is what? Uh, glossopharyngea. So afferent fibers. Of the, of the yes, this uh, the afferent nerve carry the information to the brainstem where they will stimulate the salivatory nuclei and then to which will bring about what um, salivary secretion. This is what we want to look at now. Okay, so we have looked at the conditioned reflexes, we've looked at what the unconditioned reflexes. Okay, the conditioned reflexes are responsible for the cephalic phase, the unconditioned reflexes are responsible for what for the buccal phase. Okay, and let's, so let's look at the osophagastro salivary or gastro salivary reflexes. The osophagastro salivary or the gastro salivary reflexes. Okay, these are responsible for the gastro um, for the gastro intestinal phase of salivary secretion. Okay, now we are talking about the esophagastro or esopho gastro salivary secretion some books will call it the esophago salivary secretion the gastro intestinal phase of salivary secretion and how does it happen now we said that the 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 gastro intestinal phase occurs what during swallowing during swallowing during swallowing or by or in pathological disorders like gastric ulcer or gastric cancer so irritation of the what of the lower esophagus leads to reflex salivation. You can you can think you can just nice, or you can think of scenarios when you have eaten food and probably maybe as as was eating was it maybe it irritated your lower esophagus. There was what there was um, some sort of salivation, right? Then we also have instances where uh, there is a um, reflex salivation which occurs as a result of uh, irritation of the stomach or irritation of the upper part of the small intestines. For example, during before vomiting. How many of us have vomited before? Can you remember salivating? It starts with, with nausea, goes to retching, and then vomiting. Okay, we'll talk about vomiting. I think that should be uh, in the next class. Yes, in the next in next week, we'll talk about vomiting next week. Okay, so it starts with nausea, then goes to retching, then what? Vomiting. And one of those is what is what marked uh, salivation. Okay, so what is the reflex? Remember, the reflex, these reflex are initiated by nerve impulses that originate in the walls of the irritated viscera. Okay, the stomach or the small intestines. So that when there's an irritation of the viscera, either by chemicals, by a tumor, and these impulses are transmitted via afferent vagal nerves. Okay, they are transmitted what? 
after and vegan if you remember the vegan uh, supply what we said the esophagus actually we said the pharynx the stomach the small intestines and the upper part of the large intestines and then the pelvic nerve supplies what the low the the lower part of the large intestines and what the the anorectum okay so so when there is irritation there is a stimulation of nerve endings and this sensory information is picked up by afferent vega nerve fibers to the brain stem okay and they stimulate what they stimulate the salivary nuclei okay they they provide additional saliva which acts now so when they stimulate the salivary nuclei and brings about salivation what happens this could be also, this would also be an important thing so this additional saliva uh, sets up peristalsis in the okay this additional saliva can wash the irritant okay this um uh, this uh, peristalsis this saliva which sets up peristalsis in the esophagus can drive the irritating food downward and wash the irritant downward and help remove its effects okay and it can help remove its effects by dilution or by what by neutralization okay in case of vomiting the secreted saliva helps to buffer the acidic the gastric acid okay it helps to buffer what the acidic content okay it helps to buffer the the acidic content so we would look at um Composition and formation of saliva. What is the composition and what is the form and how is saliva formed? Please take note. What is the composition and the formation of saliva? Okay. We remember saliva is produced from the salivary glands. And these salivary glands are under nervous supply. And this saliva salivation or production of saliva is under uh, nervous control and goes through three phases. Buca, uh, cephalic, buccal, and gastrointestinal phases. What is the amount of saliva produced daily at rest? It's about 1.5 liters and has a pH of resting glands of, of about seven. That means when the glands are at rest, when they are not stimulated, okay, there's about seven. So when they are active, during active secretion, the pH can approach eight. Okay, we will talk about that. So the volume of saliva produced daily is what? 1.5 liter at rest. Of course, it could be produced more. Excuse me, please. And the pH from the resting gland, that means just basal secretion, is about seven, it's neutral. But in active secretion, it approaches eight due to addition of bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is alkaline, right? Okay, so pH is hypoosmotic, is hypotonic relative to plasma. Okay, the pH of saliva is seven. Okay, and these solids are these solids are inorganic ions, and we we'll have what organic ions okay this solid these solids are inorganic ions and what and these solids are inorganic ions and what organic constituents so for the inorganic ions we have sodium we have potassium we have chloride we have bicarbonate okay the bicarbonate acts as a buffer even the chloride will help act as, a, as an activator. We'll look at that. And we also have calcium, we also have phosphates, and we have by, uh, okay, we have mentioned bicarbonate. Okay, so we have sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonates. Okay, and then for organic constituents, we have, there are mainly digestive enzymes. We have tylene, which is salivary amylase. We mentioned that yesterday. We have lingua lipase. We have lingua lipase. This is the enzyme that is secreted by the von Epner's gland. Mm -hmm. It's secreted by the von Epner's gland. We have mucin, okay, produced from the mucous cells of the of the asina. And the one the function of mucin it lubricates food and acts as a buffer. What is the function of mucin? It lubricates food and acts as what buffer. Okay. In addition, we have uh, the saliva contains immunoglobulin A. Okay. Remember last year when we were doing blood, we had the five immunoglobulins. And the immunoglobulin A was present in surface secretions. 
Okay, immunoglobulin A was present in what? In surface secretions. Okay, so we have immunoglobulin A. They also have lysozyme. We have lysozyme. We have uh, lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is bacteriostatic. It's, uh, it's a bacteriostatic, so it, it stops the it, 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 it stops the multiplication of bacterial growth. And then we also have minute amounts of glucagon. We have somastostatin. We have renin. We have nerve growth factor. Even all the, some of these ones may not have been, their functions may not have been established in in the buccal cavity, but then they are constituents of saliva. Okay, we have inorganic constituents: sodium potassium chloride, bicarbonate, calcium, phosphates. We have organic, which are mostly enzymes. So we have thylin, we have um, lingua lipase. We also have mucin, it's a chemical which is in lubricating food and acting as a buffer. We have mucin. Then we have lactoferrin, we have uh, lysozyme, we have uh, proline rich. Okay, which protect the teeth enamel. Okay, these protein rich proteins protect what the teeth enamel and by toxic tannins. Okay, proteins. Okay, protect enamel and also bind tannins. Okay, so bind tannins. Okay, so that and we also mentioned it could also contain. Mm, glucagon, somastotatin, renin, nerve growth factor. Oh, okay, I thought I typed proline rich proteins. Okay, proline that means proteins that are rich in proline and help protect the, they help protect the enamel. Okay, and they also bind tannins. Okay, okay, then let's look at the formation of saliva. Okay. Saliva is formed from the ECF, okay? And the formation of saliva is primarily an active process. It's formed from the, C from, the e uh, from the ECF, okay? And so most of the inorganic ions are secreted by the acinar cells together with mucin, okay? Together with mucin and zymogen uh, granules, okay? And so zymogen, Venus, okay, so the, the inorganic ions are secreted by what? By acina cells, okay, and uh, together with mucin and zymogen granules, okay, and these zymogen granules do what? Contain thylene or salivary alpha salivary amylase or salivary alpha amylase, okay, okay, it's isotonic, that means it, it is uh, isotonic relative to what? To relative to plasma, okay. Plasma, but the iod the iod the iodine or the iodide ion concentration is increased. Follow, the iodide ion concentration is increased. The chloride ion concentration is decreased. The bicarbonate ion concentration is same with plasma. Okay, so the initial uh, secretion, salivary secretion, which is formed, the initial one that is formed is isotonic. Okay, with sodium ion and potassium ion concentration similar to that of ECF or plasma, the iodide concentration is increased. The, the iodide concentration is increased and the bicarbonate concentration is same while the chloride concentration is, is decreased. Okay, Christopher Chan Banda said the, the, the zymogen granules contain thylene. I mentioned that what the acinar cells, the inorganic constituents or ions are secreted by the acinar cells together with mucin and zymogen granules. Okay, and these zymogen granules contain what? Contain thylene. Okay, so I'm not mentioning that. Probably maybe that may answer what Chisha is asking that um, the, the initial production is isotonic, okay? It's isotonic. And when we talk about isotonic, it's, it's what relative to what? To plasma. Remember, the saliva is formed from what? From plasma, from, e, from, from ECF, okay? And so the sodium and the potassium ion concentrations are similar to that of plasma for this initial secretion. 
the um, iodide concentration is higher in saliva than in plasma. The chloride concentration is decreased than in plasma, is lower than in plasma, while the bicarbonate is the same, it's unchanged. Okay, but now when this, this is the primary secretion, there is also there is now modification, what called ductular modification. Okay, we have what called ductular modification. Ductular modification. That's where this primary secretion is modified in the ducts. So what happened? There is uh, the ducts. The salivary column is modif modified by the uh, by the ducts by extracting sodium and chloride. Chloride is extracted. Okay, sodium ion is extracted. The chloride ion is extracted. While potassium is added and bicarbonate is added. Okay, but the volume does not change. Why? Because the ductular cells impermeable what? to water. The duct walls are also relatively impermeable to water. So the volume is, remains the same, but the sodium concentration decreases because sodium is reabsorbed, chloride is reabsorbed, but potassium is secreted into it and bicarbonate is secreted into it. So the, the final saliva contains higher concentrations of potassium and bicarbonate relative to what? Relative to plasma. Okay. Now, but when when salivary flow, when okay, when there's a rapid flow of saliva, there is less time for modification. If the saliva will still be hypotonic, but it will be closer to isotonic, okay, and it will contain high sodium and chloride. Okay, I will take it over again, it's clean for you to understand. We mentioned that we had a primary secretion. That primary secretion has uh, sodium and potassium concentration the same. The primary secretion has sodium and potassium the same, okay? Because I remember I told you saliva is produced from ECF, okay? So uh, sodium and potassium concentration in the initial secretion, in the primary secretion is, is, uh, is the same as in ECF. Okay, then secondly, the iodide concentration in the primary secretion is higher than in the ECF. Then third, the chloride concentration in the primary secretion is lower than in the ECF. Then fourth, the bicarbonate concentration is the same as in the ECF. But then there's ductular modification of this primary secretion. There is ductular modification of this primary secretion. How, what is modified? The, um, there is reabsorption of sodium and chloride. That means the end uh, saliva has a lower, a decreased sodium concentration than in the, in the ECF, and a decreased chloride concentration than in the ECF. But now potassium and bicarbonate are secreted into the ductular content. So the end product, the end saliva, has a higher potassium concentration than in the ECF, and what? A higher bicarbonate concentration, okay? A higher bicarbonate concentration. Especially when, especially during what? During, um, during active stimulation, okay? During active stimulation, okay? When, when the glands are stimulated. Okay, then we also have the hormone aldosterone. The hormone aldosterone increases potassium secretion and sodium reabsorption. Remember aldosterone? acts on the distal convoluted tubule to impact on sodium reabsorption and potassium uh, secretion, right? So it also affects the ducts, okay? So let's look at functions of saliva. Functions of saliva, okay? Functions of saliva. Um, the, the first function is, uh, is digestive function. Class rep, this is when you are just joining the class, almost like one hour after. Okay, so the digestive function, okay, we have, the first one is the enzyme, tylene, okay, the enzyme, tylene, we said um, the salivary alpha amylase. What is tylene, what does it do? You've, you've heard of amylase, you have already heard of amylase, so it, it works on carbohydrates. So this salivary 
amylase starts the digestion of starch, especially cooked starch. Okay, and so this occurs mostly in the stomach. Why should saliva, salivary amylase be acting mostly within the stomach? Somebody has an idea? I think anybody that answers that question now, you receive, I think, a 20, a 20 quarter, uh, to whatever is mobile top of whatever, whatever is worth 20 quarter now. The, the, the enzyme tiling start digestion of starch, okay? But this, of course, mostly in the stomach. Uh, there is somebody, why some Please, I've told you, <clears throat> learn to ask questions properly. What is the effect of aldosterone? Be cautious, please. What is the effect of aldosterone? Sir, can you take it over on the effect of aldosterone, okay? So I'm talking about the functions of saliva. Okay, it is uh, said, uh, and I said, sorry, please. <coughs> so I said, the enzyme tiling, that's beautiful. Who is a Prince Bualia? Because food doesn't stay too long in the mouth. Please make sure you send me your, your mobile, whatever you think, what is your, your number that I can top you up with a 20 quarter. It's okay. Uh, Prince Bualia has answered the question. He said, because food doesn't stay too long in the mouth. Okay, food doesn't stay too long in the mouth. Even saliva is produced in the, the saliva amylase is produced from the glands in the mouth, but then the food doesn't stay long, but it's acted in the stomach. So it acts in the stomach, but then what, okay, champion says it's activated by acid. On the contrary, it's inactivated by the acid. Okay, now, but then the question now that your response is answering is, why doesn't it act for long in the stomach? Because it's inactivated by the acidity of the stomach. Okay? So, but then why does it stay, why does it act more but in the stomach? Why is it action mostly in the stomach? It's because food doesn't stay long in the mouth. Okay? But then it only acts for a short time in the stomach because it's inactivated by the acidic, acidity of the stomach. So, Prince, Maya, please make sure you, you contact me. I don't know if you have my number, but somehow make sure you contact me on that. that that's good. Okay, I like uh, rewarding, rewarding answers. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what does, um, <clears throat> sorry, please. So the salivary alpha amylase, what does it do? It splits starch into smaller molecules. Okay, it splits starch into smaller molecules like oligosaccharides, which includes the disaccharide maltose, the trisaccharide maltotriose, and alpha limit dextrin. I'm sure you've done chemistry of macromolecules, right? So you know that you have disaccharides, you have trisaccharides, okay, and you also have um, other. Um, um, other forms of carbohydrates, okay? So as uh, salivary alpha amylase, which is maltose, the trisaccharide maltotriose, and what? Alpha limit dextrins, 6.7. And it requires it as an activator. Okay, so salivary amylase requires chloride as an activator. And so, but however, it plays a minor role in starch digestion, why? Because first, the fact is that food doesn't stay long in the mouth. And secondly, it is rapidly inhibited by potent gastric acidity. Okay, it is rapidly inhibited by what? By the gastric acidity. We mentioned that we had two enzymes that are produced from the, from the mouth, from the buccal cavity, from the salivary glands. What are they? Salivary alpha amylase and lingual lipase. Where is the lingual lipase produced from? From the uh, from the Ebner's glands, okay, from the von Ebner glands, okay. So, and this lingual lipase starts the lipid digestion, acting on triglycerides, isn't it? Breaking them into what? To fatty acids and, and glycerol, okay. Breaking them to what? To fatty acids and what? And glycerol. <clears throat> so the first function of saliva is what? Digestive function. <clears throat> then the second function is what? It keeps the buccal cavity moist. Okay, for people like us who are hypersecretors of saliva, 
Okay, it keeps the buccal cavity moist. Okay. And then, what is the importance of keeping the buccal cavity moist? It helps in the articulation of speech. Sometimes as, as, you, as you're teaching, as you're teaching, your mouth gets dry, okay? So you have your experience called xerostomia. So your mouth gets dry because there's what? There's decreased production of saliva. And so sometimes speech becomes difficult because saliva aids in speech, okay? Saliva aids in, it facilitates speech, aiding in speech by facilitating the movement of the lips and the tongue, okay? Saliva aids in speech by facilitating what? The movements of the lips and the tongue. It also then the third mission lubricates food, lubricates food, thus facilitating facilitating the process of what deglutition. Okay, it lubricates food, helping the food to form a bolus that can be easily swallowed. Okay, the other word for swallowing is what deglutition, deglutition. Okay, so the fourth function it also serves as a solvent. It serves as a solvent. So when you take in food, the food is dissolved in saliva so that it can be easily detected or by the test spots. Okay, so this helps the food. It helps to dissolve the food into molecules that can be what detected by the receptors on the test spots. So it tests sensation. Okay, to taste food. What is the fit function of saliva? The fit function of saliva it keeps the mouth and the teeth clean. Okay. So sometimes when you're talking and you talk for long, for example, like most teachers, you for, for me, and you talk, your mouth gets dry, isn't it? Because what there is decreased saliva. So it, uh, it keeps the mouth and the teeth clean, and it contains an active bacterial enzyme called what lysoaminoglobulins can do, or what they do, okay? So therefore, deficient salivary circulation, uh, saliv salivation, deficient salivation, which is called xerostomia, predisposes to buccal inflammation, what we call stomatitis. Okay. So we have secretion or deficient salivation predisposes to what? Stomatitis. And please, stomatitis is not the inflammation of the stomach. Okay. So you have infest and bad and odor. Okay. And also leads to dysphagia. That means if there is uh, xerostomia, there's decreased salivation in what? This figure, okay? This figure, that's difficulty in swallowing. This figure. You know that if there is no salivation, it's difficult to swallow, right? And then you also have dysphagia, difficult speech. Dysphagia is difficult in swallowing. Dysphagia, uh, difficult in speech. Okay? Remember, we mentioned that it contains mucin, it contains bicarbonate at about seven. So the saliva chemical substance that will prevent the alteration of the pH either by donating or accepting hydrogen ions, right? And why is it important? Because if the saliva, if saliva is acidic, it will increase calcium solubility. Well, okay, uh, Catherine, please, what is the active bacteria name? Okay, uh, we, we talked of, um, we talked of uh, lysozyme. We have lysozyme. And then we have uh, lactoferrin. We have lactoferrin. Okay. So the, 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 the function I was talking about was about salivary buffers, or buffers keep the oral pH at near neutral and antagonize its change. And I was saying that if the pH of the saliva is acidic, it will favor calcium solubility. And imagine the, 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 the teeth are, are, high, are made of highly of calcium phosphate, right? So if there is calcium solubility, it will lead to what? Loss of the enamel of the teeth. Okay, loss of the enamel of the teeth. What again do these buffers do? The salivary buffers also help to neutralize gastric acidity and relieve the heart for and relieve heartburn. Okay. So sometimes you experience what we call regurgitation, right? 
you are regurgitating things from your from your stomach into your esophagus, sometimes even back to, back into your mouth. That is, you are predisposing the epithelium of the esophagus to the harshness, to the harsh acidity of the stomach. So what happens? This the the, the buffers in the saliva help can neutralize what the the gastric acidity and can relieve heartburn due to what regurgitation of the gastric juice into the esophagus. Okay, so it's also important that then the saliva also acts as a dilution medium for irritant substances. So you can be able to dilute irritant substances can get diluted in saliva. So it also helps us heat loss, okay, through evaporation. But this is mostly in dogs. That's why you see dogs panting. <laughs> so what? Well, that uh, thereby that one serves as a way of a heat loss, okay. And decreased salivation in case of dehydration leads to sensation of thirst. Okay, when you when you're salivating, when there's a decrease in salivation, sorry, you can feel some some sensation of thirst. Sometimes we call this what peripheral thirst mechanism. Okay, or this there are some receptors that we detect we detect that, and uh, we call that peripheral um, um, the peripheral thirst centers. Okay. Now, and by you drinking water, it helps to maintain what water balance in the body, okay? And saliva can also serve as an excretory channel for certain organic substances like urea, acetone, uh -huh, some inorganic salts like mercury, lead, iodine, fluorine, okay? So that is that is quite important, okay? So please, if you, we've mentioned like 10 functions of saliva, so if, if I ask you about functions of saliva, don't just play around with it and talk of digestion and swallowing, okay? And the functions we've mentioned. Okay, the next thing we'll look at is mastication, chewing. Mastication, what, or chewing, okay? Mastication, what, or chewing. Okay, what is mastication? Of course, process of breakdown of large food particles into what? Into smaller pieces, into small pieces. So we're talking about mastication. Now remember, to us, we are talking about immunoglobulins, right? So we have these antibodies could be present in the saliva, right? And then there is a study we would uh, when we I don't know if we did uh, blood grouping. We could also detect blood groups from saliva, right? There are many uh, molecules. There are many immunologic molecules that are present where you can use saliva to detect uh, uh, maybe antibodies most often, of course, against uh, specific uh, uh, antigens or against specific uh, microorganisms. So uh, in saliva you have, you definitely have antibodies against specific uh, antigens or microorganisms in which the immune system has been presented with, okay? We could also detect blood grouping from saliva even the urine, okay? Okay. Um, may I, uh, Vincent is asking, now I get, we could look at it from different angles. First could be an issue of, because for stroke, there are areas of the brain probably that are affected, which could lead to paralysis of nerves supplying uh, muscles of the mouth, you understand? So in which could be mostly heart palate or affect the flow of, of, of the draining of saliva. Okay, that is one aspect. I don't know which whether it could also lead to, to changes in cardiovascular parameters like pressure. Okay, but then with that issue, that issue of uh, paralysis could be okay, could be an issue, of course, of the muscles in the buccal cavities, because um, it may not be every patient with stroke. But then we, we know that with stroke, there's more or less like uh, paralysis or flaccidity of, uh, of of muscles, isn't it? So, and the buccal cavity is made of skeletal muscles, even the tongue, the, the heart palate, even the, the pharynx and other things. So, it, I want to think that that would look at that, but that's, that's a good question. And I'm, I think I'm not far from the answer. Okay. 
And uh, Samuel, I think I've answered your question. So for you to diagnose something in any body fluid, there must be a presence of antibodies or antigens in that body fluid. And I, but I think what more is that what there will be a presentation of antibodies in that fluid. Okay. So we're looking at mastication. Mastication is a process of breakdown of large food particles into small pieces, okay? And then it involves actions of the teeth, okay? As well as movements of the lips, the cheeks, the tongue, and the mandible. Breaking down large food particles into smaller ones, involving teeth, uh, the, and then uh, movements of the lips, the cheeks, the tongue, and the mandible. Okay, and then the movement of the mandible is performed by the muscles of mastication. Okay, the movement of the mandibles is performed by the muscles of mastication. And we have four muscles of four pairs of muscles of mastication on one side and the other side. We have the masseter, we have the temporalis muscle, we have the masseter muscles, we have the temporalis muscles, we have the med medial and the lateral pterygoid. The medial and the lateral pterygoid muscles, okay? And these nerves are supplied by what? By the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So they are supplied by, and the trigeminal nerve is what? It's the fifth cranial nerve, okay? So we talked about this mastication. What does it involve? What, what are the muscles of mastication? What is the nerve supply to the muscles of mastication, okay? Mastication can occur voluntarily, but the, rhythm, the rhythmic opening and closing of the mouth is primarily a reflex. We call it, we call it the chewing reflex, okay? So mastication can occur voluntarily, and, uh, but then the rhythmic opening of the, of the mouth, the rhythmic opening and closing of the mouth, uh, it's primarily a reflex, okay? Zami, Lungu, so uh, please, uh, can you re repeat the ma muscles of mastication, okay? We have the masseter muscle. The masseter muscle. We have the temporalis. Temporalis muscle. And you have the media and lateral pericoid. Okay. You have the medial and the lateral pterygoid muscle. Okay, that's important. So when I said uh, the chewing, mastication is a voluntary, can be initiated voluntarily, but it is the opening and closure of the mouth is actually a what? Um, it's actually inhibition of muscles of the lower jaw. So when food is introduced into the mouth, when food is introduced into the mouth, lower jaw drops. When the lower jaw drops, this causes a stretching. It causes a stretch reflex, which causes contraction closure of the mouth. Listen, please. Explaining lower jaw. Now, when this when there's an inhibition of the muscles, they relax. When they relax, the lower jaw drops. When they relax, what? The lower jaw drops. And when the lower jaw drops, it causes what? A stretch. As it drops, it stretches the muscles. We call that is a stretch reflex. And the stretch reflex leads to contraction and closure of the mouth. Okay? So we've looked at what is mastication. What, what does it involve? Then the muscles of mastication and then the what? The chewing reflex. Okay, so what are the functions of mastication? What are the functions of mastication? First, it helps in swallowing. Okay, I'm sure we will not have a problem. So the first thing is it helps in what? Swallowing. How does it help in swallowing? First, by mixing the food particles with saliva, which softens and lubricates food. Okay, so it helps in swallowing by mixing the food particles with what? With saliva, which helps soften the food and lubricates the food. 
Okay, uh, Sarah Whitaker is asking, please can you repeat the reflex? Okay, please follow. The presence of food in the mouth causes a reflex inhibition of the muscles of the lower jaw. Okay, the presence of food in the mouth causes a reflex inhibition of the muscles what of the lower jaw and when there is a reflex inhibition these muscles relax okay when they relax what happens the jaw drops huh? when the jaw drops it initiates a, a stretch reflex okay the initial when the jaw when the jaw drops the muscles are stretched there's a stretch reflex and this stretch reflex brings about what the contraction of the muscles and closure of the mouth Okay, so that is a chewing reflex. Okay, so we are talking about the functions of mastication. The first one is what helps in swallowing. How? By mixing the food particles with saliva, softening it, and lubricating the food. Secondly, by forming a bolus that can easily be swallowed. I know some of you, sometimes you overlook the, the importance of chewing because some of you are are quite familiar with swallowing without chewing. I don't. I can. I can only imagine how you swallow without chewing. The kind of operations your stomach must be undergoing, predisposing you to lesions in your in your stomach. Okay. So we have uh, the first thing helps swallowing how by mixing food with the saliva, softening it, and lubricating the food. Secondly, by forming formation of a bolus. That can be the second function of mastication it helps digestion okay how by using the surface area of the food to action of enzyme to the action of enzyme you have to chew so as to crush the the cellulose the indigestible cellulose coating of plants and then you expose the inside to what to digestive enzymes okay this is especially important for digestion of vegetables fruits and fruits. So what is the third function? It reduces mechanical damage to the GIT mucosa. It reduces what? Mechanical damage. I told you about not chewing food. Imagine swallowing a bowl. I'm sure you're already thinking of the last time you swallowed. At least you can testify how you felt with your stomach. You can even bruise your gas, your, your esophagus. Okay? And actually mechanical damage your GIT mucosa. And if there's damage to your GIT mucosa, that particular area, it will be faced with assault from gastric acidity and other uh, irritants. What other importance of, of, of chewing? It leads to stimulation of the what? Of the taste and smell receptors. You know, food is as good as it tastes as well as as good as it smells, isn't it? Even though we have Food that smells well, but never tastes well. Okay? So, those are the functions of mastication. And so, lastly, or not lastly, we still have a little way to go, but then we need to finish this. Deglutition. So, by swallowing, pouring. Okay? So, we're only exp ex explaining the things you do not see when the process is occurring. Okay, so we are talking about what? Deglutition. 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 Linus says, uh, kindly repeat the last function of mastication. Okay, for the purpose of others, let me stick. The first one, it helps in swallowing. We mentioned by mixing food particles with saliva and softens and lubricates food. And then we say, in that also lubricates the bolus that can be easily swallowed. We said the second function is it helps digestion by increasing the exposed surface area of food to digestive enzymes. And this is important in, um, in digestion of vegetables and, and, and fruits. Then third, we said it also reduces mechanical damage to the GIT. And the fourth, it leads to what? To stimulation of taste and smell receptors. Okay. I, I hope that has answered you. So we are looking at deglutition. Okay, deglutition. So what is deglutition? Deglutition is the act of swallow of transferring food from the buccal cavity to the stomach. And what I was mentioning before the network interrupted is that the process we are discussing, please, these things are you are familiar with them, 
but we want to give scientific terminology to them and also explain what is occurring without your notice. Because what, what is quite simple and something you should uh, be excited knowing. So the next time you're eating in the evening, explain to your to your siblings or to your parents, this is the process occurring in, inside of you members in the evening. Okay? And to tell them that the money they are spending on you in school is not for nothing. At least if you can explain to them swallowing, that's enough. Okay? So, it says the act of transferring food into the stomach. Okay? And how we can study this by, we can study this from successive x-rays taken while swallowing. Okay? While swallowing a bedroom salt, what we call bedroom meal. For some of you who have gone to the hospital, sometimes they will give you a bedroom meal. And while you're swallowing that, they are recording that, they're filming that. Okay? They are filming that. Okay, <clears throat> so what are we discussing? We are discussing swallowing. Okay, we are discussing swallowing. So make sure you explain this process of swallowing to somebody in the evening, at least maybe after supper or before supper, you can intimidate somebody with swallowing. Okay, and you can actually view, visualize the swallowing process taking place. So we have three phases or stages. We have the buccal phase, we have the pharyngeal phase, and we have the oesophageal phase. Okay, let's look at the buccal phase. We are talking about what? Swallowing. The act of transferring food from the buccal cavity to the stomach. Food is in the buccal cavity. The process of moving it from the buccal cavity after being chewed, and probably maybe, maybe not chewed for those who don't chew, from the buccal cavity to the stomach. And we have three different phases. In the buccal cavity, in the pharynx, and then in the esophagus. Okay, so let's look at the buccal cavity. Let's look at the buccal phase. Okay, let's look at the buccal phase. So the buccal phase, this is a voluntary phase. It's a voluntary phase. After mastication and formation of a suitable bolus, the tongue, or what Zambians call it, what the tongue, okay? Okay, whatever one, the T-O-N-G-U-E, okay? So the tongue is voluntarily elevated against the heart palate, okay? The tongue is voluntarily elevated against what? The heart palate. Okay? And the elevation of the heart palate is due to the contraction of the myelohyoid muscle. Okay? The myelohyoid muscle. Okay, somebody is trying to ask me clarity on the reflex of the chewing reflex. Did, did I say when food is in the mouth? The muscles inhibit and relax, which causes the lower, lower jaw to open. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, somebody can somebody answer that question on the comment list? Can somebody explain the chewing reflex on that comment list while we proceed? Okay, because I've taken I've, I've repeated that more than three times. Okay, of a suitable balus, the tongue after the process of mastication and formation of a balus, the tongue is voluntarily elevated against the heart, heart palate by contraction of what? The myelohyoid muscles, okay? So the bolus is now propelled backward because the tongue is elevated to the heart palate by the contraction of the myelohyoid muscle, the bolus is propelled backward into the pharynx, okay? The mouth must be closed, okay? The mouth must be closed, so swallowing becomes difficult if the mouth is open. For example, while you are at the dentist and the dentist is walking, swallowing becomes difficult. How many of you swallow with your mouth? <clears throat> Think about that. Okay. So please, uh, somebody ask a question on the clarity of the reflex. Please make sure it, that question is answered. Okay. Make sure that question is answered. So uh, we have talked about the buccal phase, which is a voluntary phase. And after mastication, and formation of a suitable balus, the tongue is elevated against the heart palate by contraction of the myelohyoid muscle. And so this propels the balus of the food to the, to the end of the, of the pharynx, okay? To the end of the pharynx. And the mouth must be closed, okay? So that's the buccal phase. So where is our food now? Our food is at the pharynx, okay? Our food is at the what? At the pharynx. Don't mind me pointing behind, but then I'm just giving the picture that is behind the mouth, okay? 
So the pharyngeal phase is an involuntary phase. Okay, the pharyngeal phase is an involuntary phase because it occurs as a result of a reflex called the swallowing reflex. Okay, so the pharyngeal phase is as a result of a, the swallowing reflex, and it's what is an involuntary phase. Okay. So what, 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 what do we mean by that? Once it starts, it cannot be stopped. It cannot be prevented. Okay? Once it starts, it cannot be prevented. Please, I'm still waiting for somebody to answer the question uh, posed by a student there. That also to give me the idea that you followed. And so please, somebody should uh, make sure that question is answered. Okay? And type it there and let's follow. Okay? So the... Okay. Go, okay, Vincent has said presence of food in the mouth causes reflex inhibition of the lower jaw muscles. Okay, that's correct. And the muscles relax. And then now the muscle relax. Okay, get this one, Vincent. When the, mu mu when the muscles relax, the lower jaw drops. Okay, when the lower jaw drops, this leads to a stretch reflex. Okay, stretching the muscles, which leads to contraction of the muscles and closure of the muscles, okay? That's beautiful. Please, when somebody asks a question and if you have the answer, type it from what I've said, okay? That will also engage and keep us moving, okay? So we are in the pharyngeal phase, okay? And we said this is an involuntary phase because it occurs as a result of a reflex called a swallowing reflex, okay? That means once it starts, it cannot be prevented. Okay, no, remember where is our food? Our, where is our bolus, not the food again? Our bolus, because it has already been crushed, mixed with saliva and lubricated. So our, it, it stimulates certain receptors that are located at the pharyngeal opening. Okay, they are located at the pharyngeal opening. Now you remember when you did a pharyngeal pouch um, and the pharyngeal arch in, in anatomy? Is it, in, is it in biology? Okay. So, so the pharyngeal opening, pharyngeal opening. So the bolus of the food, or the bolus, sorry, is pushed backwards. And when it's put, pushed backwards, it stimulates what? It stimulates certain receptors that are located in the pharyngeal opening. Okay. Especially in an area called the tonsil, the tonsillar pillars. So these receptors are called the swallowing, this area is called the swallowing receptor area. It is present where? In the tongue scapulas, okay? In the pharyngeal opening, okay? What about the swallowing receptor area? Okay, it's called what? The swallowing receptor area. And this swallowing receptor area, in this swallowing receptor, this swallowing receptor area is present what? In the tongue scapulas, okay? That's present in the pharyngeal opening, where the it's voluntarily elevated against the heart palate. The tongue is voluntarily elevated against what the heart palate. Okay, and this is mainly due to what contraction of the mylohyoid muscle, and this pushes the the bolus to the end to the rear of the buccal cavity. Okay, that is the end of the buccal phase, and the buccal phase is voluntary. Is voluntary. Why the pharyngeal phase is involuntary, okay? And when the bolus is pushed to the pharynx, it stimulates the, uh, the some receptors in the tonsillar pillars. Uh, this area is called the swallowing receptor area, okay? And once it is it is stimulated, the signals are transported via afferent nerves, via afferent fibers in the fifth and the ninth cranial nerve, okay? What is the fifth cranial nerve and what is the ninth cranial nerve? What is the fifth cranial nerve and what is the ninth cranial nerve? We said, okay, the, the signals from the tonsilla, from the swallowing receptor area are, are picked up by afferent fibers in the fifth and the ninth cranial nerve. And these are taken to the swallowing area or to the degradation center to the swallowing center or the degradation center in the medulla oblongata, okay? In the medulla oblongata. So from the center, impulses are discharged 
via the fifth, the ninth, the tenth, and the twelfth cranial nerve. Okay, so from this signals are transferred or are transported by afferent fibers in the fifth and the ninth cranial nerves. And I've asked the question, what is the fifth and the ninth cranial nerve? I have 108 people following me, at least one or two persons should be able to tell me what the fifth and the ninth cranial nerve are. So signals in the fifth and the ninth cranial nerve are taken to the swallowing or the deglutition center in the medulla oblongata. That's beautiful. Chisha has said the fifth cranial nerve is the trigeminal nerve. Okay, that's that's beautiful. The fifth cranial nerve is what? The trigeminal nerve. And the ninth is growth of pharyngeal. That's beautiful. Okay. So from the deglutition center, impulses, they are sent through the fifth, the ninth, the tenth, and the twelfth cranial nerve. Okay, and the 12th cranial nerve. So they are sent through the motor fibers, through the motor fibers of the 12th cranial nerves. Okay, Taonga Yezas, that's a, the glossopharyngeal. Okay, and, the, and the, what are the 10th and the 12th cranial nerves? Okay, sex. One, protective reflexes. Okay, they bring about what? Protective reflexes. Please follow Kindi about the protective reflexes. I'll ask this one way or the other, okay, about the protective reflexes. What, what, what is the purpose of these protective reflexes? These reflexes prevent food entry into the nasal cavities and trachea, okay? So the, these reflexes help prevent food from entering the nasal cavities to what? To the bigger cavity. Okay, that's beautiful. Mwamba Boala, the 12 is a hypoglossa. Glossa has to do with what the tongue, isn't it? So you can imagine, okay? So let's look at the protective reflexes. So we have several protective reflexes that, has a, that occur as a result of stimulation of the, the swallowing receptor area. And when the swallowing receptor area is stimulated by the balloons, food is picked up, picked up by the fifth and the ninth cranial nerves, the afferent fibers in them, the sensory components of these nerves, and information is taken to the deglutition cellula, the ninth glossopharyngeal, tenth of it, that's Vegas, Linus, and Nachizo, yes, of course, have mentioned that one. The, 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 the tenth is what? The Vegas nerve, okay? And so these bring about if certain effects, okay? Brings about certain effects. And one of them is what the protective reflexes. And what is the purpose of the protective reflexes? Preventing food entrance into the nasal cavity and into the trachea. Okay? Protecting food from regurgitating back into the what? Into the buccal cavity. And so what are the protect what are the reflex? What are the protective reflexes? One, ele elevation of the soft palate. Okay? Elevation of the soft palate. So the first. Protective left reflex is what? Elevation of the soft palate. Okay? Elevation of what? Of the soft palate. What does it do? This is what? This shuts off the posterior nasal opening. It shuts off the posterior nasal opening, preventing foot reflux into the nasal cavities. Okay? So what is the first? Protective reflex. Elevation of what? Of the soft palate. Okay? Then the second, elevation of the larynx against the epiglottis. Elevation of the larynx against what? Against the epiglottis. Okay. Elevation of the larynx against the epiglottis. What is the first? Elevation of the soft palate. To do what? To prevent uh, food from entering the posterior, um, the food entering the nasal cavities by shutting off the posterior uh, nasal openings. Okay. So what is the second elevation of what? Of the larynx against the epiglottis, okay? So this closes, this closes the superior nasal laryngeal orifice, which is what it is. So elevation of the larynx against the, the glottis, 
This prevents food entrance into the trachea. Okay, this prevents food entrance into what? Epiglottis during swallowing is not so important. Okay, the role of the epiglottis during swallowing is not so important, even if it is removed. Okay. Reflex, elevation of the soft palate. What is the second one? Elevation of the larynx against the epiglottis. Okay, elevation of the larynx against what? The epiglottis. What is the third? And that elevation of the larynx against the epiglottis closes what? The superior laryngeal orifice, which is what? The glottis, preventing the food from entering what? The trachea. Okay? Preventing the food from entering what? The trachea. So what is the third protective reflex? Is approximation of the vocal cords. Okay? Approximation of the vocal cords than that of the epiglottis. So approximation of the vocal cords. So therefore, if we have damage of the vocal cords, Okay, we have damage of the vocal cords. This can cause what? Choking, suffocation during swallowing and food will enter what? The respiratory passages. So approximation of the vocal cords. Remember the vocal cords are controlled by what? Skeletal muscles. Huh? So approximation of the vocal cords. So if the vocal cords are damaged, they will be what? The glottis will be open and food would enter into the what? Into the respiratory passages and could also have what? Choking. You could also even aspirate your, your damage to the vocal cords. You could have infections. Infections like uh, herpes virus, Epstein-Barr virus, okay? And then you could also have um, uh, neurological disorders like Parkinson's disease, okay? You could also have amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, this will affect uh, skeletal muscles, so it can affect what? It can affect um, the this, uh, the contraction of the muscles controlling the vocal cords. Okay. So the first part, elevation of the larynx against what? Against the epiglottis. The third is what? Approximation of the vocal cords. Okay. Approximation of what? Approximation of the vocal cords. Okay. Then. We have the, the, the fourth is temporary apnea, cessation of breathing, cessation of breathing. So when we have information, impulse is taken from the swallowing receptor area via the afferent fibers of the fifth and sixth, uh, fifth and ninth cranial nerve to the deglutition center, impulse is to the respiratory center, which is very apnea. This leads to what? Stoppage of breathing. For a few seconds, it leads to a stoppage of breathing for a few seconds. Okay. Then the fifth ref, uh, uh, consequence of, of this reflex is what? Approximation of the palatopharyngeal folds. Approximation of the palatopharyngeal folds. I don't know when you are dealing with the pharyngeal arches and the pouches. I'm sure you must have talked about the palatopharyngeal muscles and other things. Okay, that is anatomy purely. But the approximation of these folds, the, the stretching of this uh, prevents passage of large food particles into the pharynx. Okay? Prevents what? Passage of large food, decayed food. Christopher is asking if I could kindly repeat on temporary amnesia. I said, in information of, in the deglutition center, the deglutition center sends inhibitory discharges to the, to the respiratory centers, inhibiting the respiratory centers, thereby causing a cessation of breathing for just a few seconds, okay? That means during swallowing, breathing ceases for a few seconds, okay? Then you have con continued contraction of the mylohyoid muscles, okay? Con continued contraction of what? of the mylohyoid muscles. We mentioned this when we were talking about the buccal face, isn't it? Okay, Amy, Joseph, I think I've just responded to that, okay? So we mentioned about the mylohyoid muscles which, whose contraction elevates the tongue against the heart palate. So there is continued contraction of the mylohyoid muscles. So this keeps the tongue in contact with the heart palate, which prevents food regurgitation in back into the buccal cavity, okay? Back into the buccal cavity.
Okay, so since the swallowing reflex is initiated by contact of food with specific receptor areas in the throat, what if we anesthetize this area? Probably maybe by painting the place with cocaine with an anesthetic agent, meaning what? The receptors will not be sensitive, isn't it? Okay, so if these areas are anesthetized, swallowing becomes impossible because there will be no um, stimulation of these swallowing receptor areas. The same thing occurs during general anesthesia, okay, due to depression of the swallowing centers. Okay, so during general anesthesia, the swallowing centers are, deep, are, are suppressed. So a vomitus may enter what? The respiratory passages. You may choke, okay? Okay, so during this, together with bronchial secretions, which accumulate due to simultaneous suppression of the cough center, may lead to choking, inability to breathe well, isn't it? Okay. Similarly, if the mouth is kept open, open during swallowing, food passage through the pharynx will not, may not be able to touch the swallowing receptor areas, okay? So the protective reflexes will not, will not occur. And this will lead the food to enter the respiratory passages or what? The nasal cavities. What I'm from explaining, I'm saying that if you keep your mouth wide open, food passage through the pharynx may not stimulate what the swallowing receptor areas and if there's no stimulation of the swallowing receptor areas information may not get to the swallowing centers and we will not have the protective reflexes or the, the protective yeah, the protective reflexes and therefore food may enter may enter the respiratory passages or what the, nas the nasal cavities okay i said the pharyngeal the pharyngea phase it has two reflexes. One, the reflexes, or it, it results to two effects, not reflexes, two effects. And the other one is what? Pharyngeal peristalsis. Okay, pharyngeal peristalsis. Contraction and relaxation of the muscles, pushing the content of the pharynx towards the, an, the anus, anal ward, okay, towards the anus. Okay, so following the protective reflexes, the superior pharyngeal muscle contracts, initiating what? A rapid peristaltic movement, okay? A rapid peristaltic movement that passes downwards over the middle of the inferior pharyngeal muscles, leading to push of the bolus into the esophagus, okay? Leading to a push of the bolus of, into the esophagus, okay? So when these muscles, when these uh, pharyngeal muscles in uh, the relaxation of the oesophageal sphincter, okay, there's a relaxation of the pharyngeal oesophageal sphincter, okay, this allows the food to, to move into the esophagus. So we have the pharyngeal oesophageal sphincter or the upper oesophageal sphincter, okay. The pharyngeal oesophageal sphincter is also called the upper oesophageal sphincter. So the last phase is the esophageal phase. Okay, please, we just have a short thing and we'll be done. So the last phase is the esophageal phase, the esophageal phase. Okay, and what did we say? The esophagus is, uh, is, 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 a, is a tube, it's a muscular tube of about 25 centimeters, and it is lined by a mucous membrane that secretes mucus. What is the importance of this mucus? It lubricates. This mucus lubricates for swallowing and protects the lower esophageal wall from regurgitated gastric juice. Okay. And so the esophagus can be divided into three parts, depending on the nature of the muscle. In the upper one third, it is made up of skeletal muscles, it's made up of striated skeletal muscles. Okay. In the lower one third, it's made up of smooth muscles. And in the middle one third, it's made up of what? It's mixed. Okay, so the upper one third is made of what? Skeletal muscle. The lower one third is made of what? Smooth muscle. And the middle, the middle one third is mixed, both skeletal and smooth. And I said that the, the, the esophagus is lined inside by what? A, a, a mucous membrane that secretes mucus. 
And what is the function of this mucus? It lubricates for swallowing and also protect lower esophageal wall from regurgitated gastric juice. Okay. The esophageal phase is also an involuntary phase, okay, in which peristatic movement occurs in the esophageal wall, propelling the bolus of the food from its upper end to the stomach. Okay. So we have in the esophagus, you can control it. This can only be done by peristatic movement. And we have two types of peristatic movements in the esophagus. We have the primary peristasis and we have the secondary peristasis. Okay, the primary peristasis is a continuation of the pharyngeal peristasis. Okay, it is it is simply a continuation of the peristatic wave that began in the in the in the pharynx. Okay, and it is produced by impulses that are discharged in the efferent vega fibers. Okay, then we have the secondary peristasis. Okay, the secondary peristasis occurs if the primary peristasis fails to propel all food that has entered the esophagus. That means when food enters the esophagus and then the primary peristasis fails to push all the food into the stomach, the secondary peristasis takes place and it starts from the side of the food. It originates in the esophagus itself. And how does it, it because the bolus causes a distension of the walls of the esophagus. Okay, and this will lead to a stretching that brings about what? A reflex contraction and relaxation of the muscles of the esophagus. Okay, and this continues until the esophagus is emptied of food, that until the esophagus empties its content into the stomach. Okay, and the, the esophageal peristalsis is pushing the food forward. Okay, it, uh, it, the, the, the wave travels at a rate of about three centimeters per second. Okay, and moves and covers the length of the esophagus in eight to 10 seconds. Okay. But in the upright position, it is much more faster than this because due to the effect of gravity. Okay. So let us look at the nervous control of esophageal peristasis. Okay. The nervous control of esophageal peristasis. Okay. Let me finish this. I don't want to give anything as an assignment, please. Both types of esophageal peristasis, both the primary and the and the and the secondary, require the integrity of the veg the vagi nerves. Okay, remember, since the primary peristasis is produced by efferent vagal nerve fibers, the secondary type is also produced by the vagovagal reflex. Can we still remember the reflexes that we discussed today under nervous control? We mentioned local axonic reflex. Which is a short reflex that takes place just within the wall of the gas of the of uh, of uh, the GIT, and then we have the ganglionic reflex in which the autonomic ganglion, which is the, the prevertebral ganglion, serves as the coordinating center, and we have the 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 central which are long reflexes. And an example of, we mentioned the the vago vega reflex, and we also mentioned esophageal peristasis. Okay, so in the in the upper one third and probably some and the middle one third, we have this vago vega reflex. It's a long reflex because uh, information picked up by afferent vega fibers taken to the swallowing center and it's brought back to the to the esophagus by the vega nerves. This is a long. This is a central reflex. Okay. And, and it is the vago vega, that's what we we'll call it the vago vega reflex. The vago vega reflex because the afferent uh, signals are picked up by the vega nerve and the efferent signals are, pick, are, are sent by, by what? Are sent through the vega nerves. So that's what we we'll call it the vago vega reflex. Vago vega reflex. Yeah, the vago vega reflex, okay, and um, so in the the, the 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 striated muscle in the upper one third is directly controlled by the vega nerves, okay, and so its movement is relatively rapid, while the smooth muscles of the lower one third is indirectly controlled by the vega nerves. So so why how 
what do we mean by the lower the smooth muscles of the lower one third is indirectly controlled by the vagal nerves? Please, who can answer that? You answer that. I there's a 50 quarter for that now. I think I owe somebody. Somebody said I don't know, I don't owe, but then I'm supposed to give a 20 quarter to somebody. I'm forgetting the name, but get get it to me. So what do we mean by the the low the smooth muscles of the lower one third are indirectly controlled by the vagal nerve? Okay, so why the answer is coming? But no, let's give the answer before I I I, I proceed before I give the Mr. Finney give the answers. Okay. So we said the the tighten muscles of the upper one third are directly controlled by the vagal nerves, and um, so its movement is relatively rapid, while the smooth muscle in the lower one third is indirectly controlled by the vagal nerves. Okay, it's just it's just a one minute question before you go and look at your notes and come and give me the answer. Okay, so why the smooth muscles of the lower one third controlled by the vega. I'm waiting for the answer. Wow. Danny Mwewa. It's like you you just come you just captured my answer. Okay? That's beautiful. That's 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 a perfect answer. So, okay. So the indirect control through the local enteric reflex receiving relay from what? From the vagus nerve, okay? So contact me after the class and, and let me let us see how we can have your fifth quarter and get, get into your hands. The, the enteric uh, nervous system, right? We mentioned that in the upper one third and in the, the mouth, we have the skeletal muscles and in the uh, the anal rectum we have the skeletal muscles, but in between we have the smooth muscles, and that's where we have your local enteric, your local enteric nerve plexuses. Okay, so uh, imagine it has to be relayed. Okay, so and then the reflexes here are local enteric reflex. Remember when we were talking about reflex, we mentioned the local enteric reflex, and I mentioned an example of it was what peristalsis. Okay, and then also we also mentioned that we have peristalsis as an example of what the central reflexes. And here, this peristalsis is in the lower, is in the upper one third of this of the esophagus because it is supplied by the vagal nerves. And then, uh, when there is a stretching of the muscles of the esophagus, uh, afferent signals are picked up by afferent fibers of the vega, the vagus, which which takes them to the swallowing center, and then brings back through the vagus nerve. So we have peristalsis occurs both by vagal reflex as well as by what? By local enteric reflexes, okay? That's, that's quite beautiful, um, Danny. A third of the, of the esophagus. Let me just put in a... In a tabular form, differentiate between okay, upper third and lower third of the esophagus. Okay. So in a tabular form, can you can you differentiate? Let's just differentiate that. It's, it's not an assignment. In a, in a tabular form, can we differentiate that quickly? What are the differences between the upper third and the lower and the lower third of the esophagus? Unis ones are present present at uh, almost when the class is over. Okay, please, can we give differences between the upper third and the lower third of the, the esophagus? Quickly, quickly, please. We, we have less than 10 or 15 minutes, please. What are the differences? 
I thought the answers would just be popping up like popcorn. What are the differences between the upper third and the lower third of the esophagus? Okay, let's continue. If, if let the differences be coming. Bureau, okay, chisha, upper third is made up of skeletal muscle. Upper third is made of skeletal muscle, lower third is made of smooth muscle. Amy Joseph, that's beautiful. Danny, upper third, skeletal muscle, lower third, okay. Okay, they are coming. Uh, Linus, lower third is not mixed. Lower third is made of smooth muscle, right? It's, it is a middle third that is mixed, okay? So, so the first uh, item is musculature. And we have mentioned that for musculature, the upper third is skeletal, the lower third is what? Smooth. Okay, let's go to the next thing. Beautiful. Upper uh, for Chisha, upper third direct control from the Vega. Okay, some will say innovation is different, but then, okay, how different is that? Okay, upper third, some will say upper third control by Vega nerve. Rian says bilateral vagotomy, upper third causes complete paralysis. Okay. So Chisha, the lower third, we have the vagus nerve plus the e ENS, okay, plus the enteric nervous system. Okay. So lower third, we have the ENS plus what? plus the enteric nervous system. So if you see indirectly control, good, but then if you indirectly control through what? Okay, uh, Vincent says lower third indirect control by Vegai through enteric nervous system. I think that's a better that's a better way to put it. I know you all have the concept, the idea, but then to put it, so Vincent has put it succinctly, he says lower third is controlled by Vegai through enteric nervous system. Okay, and so, and then there's somebody who mentioned something beautiful of oh, bilateral vagotomy, Rayan. Okay, Rayan said bilateral vagotomy of the upper one third causes complete paralysis. Okay, but in the lower third, secondary peristalsis still persists. Okay, in the, in the lower third, there will still be what secondary peristalsis. Okay, there will be secondary peristalsis in the lower third. Then we can also look at the movement. In the upper third, it is rapid, and in the lower third, it's slow. Okay? In the upper third, it's rapid, and in the lower third, it's slow. Okay? Does it make sense? Also, okay, so quickly, let's look at the esophageal sphincters. Remember, we made that beautiful. Okay? So it's rapid, in the lower third, it's slow. So we said yesterday that we have the, the gas, uh, the alimentary canal is, is a tube. Okay? Intercepted. Okay, into cavities or into into a into into regions. Okay, we mentioned we had the lower sphincter. What we'll are we talking? Well, oh, that's a good question. Okay, so we we'll look. That's what we'll be rounding off with. Okay, so we're we'll looking at what the esophageal sphincters. So we have the upper esophageal sphincter. Okay, the upper esophageal sphincter. We another thing is the uh, pharyngoesophageal sphincter. Okay, you can call it the pharyngoesophageal sphincter or the pharyngoesophageal junction. Okay, so this upper esophageal sphincter, it's at the junction of the pharynx and the esophagus. Okay, it's just about three centimeters. Okay, of the esophagus at the what? At the pharyngoesophageal junction. The resting tension in the segment is normally high. That means it's almost always uh, uh, tight. Okay. Okay, so this, the tension there is, is high, and this exerts pressure that prevents air from entering into the stomach during breathing. It prevents air from entering the stomach during breathing. Okay, and so during swallowing, it relaxes temporarily to allow the bolus of food to be forced into the esophagus by the pressure generated in the pharynx. 
okay, as a result of the pharyngeal peristalsis. So pharyngeal peristalsis generates a pressure that forces food through the pharyngoesophageal sphincter or the upper oesophageal sphincter into the oesophagus. Then after food has entered, it contracts again, preventing regurgitation back into the buccal cavity or back into the pharynx. Okay. Uh, so the next uh, sphincter is the lower oesophageal sphincter. This is an important sphincter. The lower oesophageal sphincter, which is at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach. Another sphincter. When we come, in, when we come to the stomach, uh, we'll see why you see, we see an area of the stomach called the cardia, because it's almost uh, a position uh, to the what? Uh, to the heart. Okay. So you have the lower esophageal sphincter, or the cardiac sphincter. It's a fun this is a functional sphincter. Okay, it's a very functional sphincter that extends about four centimeters above the gastroesophageal junction. So you have the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. So above it, it extends up to what? Above it, you have what? The gastroesophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter. This sphincter is normally tonically contracted. Okay. So it is tonically contracted, preventing what? Reflux of gastroesophageal content into the into the esophagus. Okay. So it but then when during uh, swallowing it relaxes, okay? It relaxes temporarily during swallowing, okay? But after once the food enters in the stomach, in what? It contracts, okay? And tightens back. So its relaxation is mediated by two chemicals, VIP or nitric oxide. Its relaxation is controlled by what? VIP, what is VIP? Vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, okay, and or nitric oxide, which what, which are released by neurons in the myenteric plexus at the lower esophagus, okay. So this VIP and nitric oxide are released by what neurons in the myenteric plexus, right? okay. So what we say it is normally tonically contracted, right? We said it is normally tonically contracted. So. Uh, if the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter is, is decreased, what happens? If the tone is decreased, it means it, the, 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 the sphincter becomes weak. It becomes incompetent. So that's what we call lower esophageal sphincter incompetence or lower esophageal incompetence, okay? Which are the incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter. So the, 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 the sphincter becomes incompetent and gastric contents regurgitate moves from the stomach into what? Into the, okay? And the large dose hormone increases the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, okay? Large doses of gastrin increases the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, but physiologically, the amount of gastrin in the blood is never too much to turn to increase the, the tone, okay? So it has almost no effect. Okay, let's look at the swallowing disorders. What are the disorders of swallowing? First is dysphagia. Dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing. Okay, this is difficulty in swallowing, and this is due to several reasons. Okay, what is dysphagia? Difficulty in swallowing. Remember when we were talking about swallowing? We mentioned we've mentioned about fifth and the ninth cranial nerve. Mentioned about, we've mentioned fifth, ninth. 10th uh, and 12th, isn't it? So if we have lesions of the 9th and the 10th cranial nerves, okay, we may have an issue with swallowing, right? And an example, if we have an infection like diphtheria, diphtheria, okay? What if we have a damage to the deglutition center? A damage to the deglutition center, for example, during poliomyelitis, Okay, what if we have an issue with um, the muscles of swallowing, a malfunctioning of the muscles of swallowing? 
in a condition of, for example, myasthenia gravis, where there is a, an ablation or a abnormalities or defect in the nicotinic receptors in the neuromuscular junction, so that it impedes the communication between the nerves and the muscles. Okay, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder in which there is antibodies. The, the body recognizes, the immune system recognizes the, the, the nicotinic receptors in the neuromuscular junction as foreign and produces antibodies and attacks and destroys them. Okay? So one of the areas that is affected is swallowing. We also have the muscles of the eyes are affected, muscles of speech are affected, and besides your skeletal muscles. Okay? So we have... Uh, what, what also, so we have things that could lead to difficulty in breathing, in swallowing. We have lesions of the ninth and the tenth cranial nerves, for example, in diphtheria. We have the, a damage of the deglutition center, for example, in poliomyelitis. And then we have malfunctioning of the swallowing muscles, okay? For example, in myasthenia gravis, okay? Then another, you could have esophageal strictures, strictures. Osophagia strictures, okay, also narrowing ulceration. I mentioned to you that the con one of the consequences of uh, gastroesophagia reflux is heartburn or osophagia ulceration. So when there is an ulcer, and then probably maybe a thing of it, then will be what? There could be a narrowing of that opening. Or what we have cancer where there's a, uh, a growth and uh, uncontrolled multiplication, it could what? Narrow that area. So it would lead to different achalasia. Mm -hmm. well, another word for achalasia is cardio cardiospasm. Okay, cardio spasm. Please, cardio Another word for achalasia is cardiospasm. Okay, so uh, this is a condition that is characterized by increased tension in the lower esophageal sphincter. Remember, we mentioned that the lower esophageal sphincter is normally tonically contracted. Okay, and this is brought about by the um, by the tone in the muscles, and then its relaxation is brought about by what nitric oxide and vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. So in achalasia. Uh, the the resting tension of the lower esophageal sphincter is increased. Okay, so this is so the achalasia is characterized by what increased resting tension in the lower esophageal sphincter, uh, characterized by incomplete relaxation of the sphincter on swallowing, and we have weak esophageal peristalsis. Okay, as a result, food transfer from the esophagus into the stomach is delayed or even blocked. So if there's an increased tension, that means what? Complete swallowing. So due to accumulation of food in the esophagus, due to delay or blockage of food there, as a result of the increased tension, this condition is probably due to what? A deficiency of the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. Okay? Deficiency of the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. Okay? And uh, how can we treat this? It can be treated by what? Uh, uh, surgical means incision of the esophageal muscle, okay? Can be treated by what? Pneumatic dilatation, okay? And uh, so far, so good. It's um, It's been a great time. If there are other questions, we'll be able to please ask them subsequently or in the platform on in, in, in my website. And so thank you for your time. Please, I sent out the the questionnaire for assessing students' perception of the learning environment. Please, it's an important questionnaire. As I told you yesterday, this is what will guide us to be able to propose certain changes, okay? Yes, we cannot propose anything but understand you know, uh, uh, without getting your perception. So please, uh, rather than complaining, make sure you fill in the, um, make sure you fill in the, um, the questionnaire. Sibanda, uh, please, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to ask a question, be polite. Please, what about the GRED? 
And so that is actually what I was to give us an assignment. Okay. So I, you have you have cut you have interrupted my discussion so far. I, I'm getting there. Okay. So um, I was talking about please filling the 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 the, the, the survey and and encourage one another to fill. This. I don't think it's more than ten minutes. Just just about fifty questions of just. Clicking, please, but be objective. Don't just click because you want to click. Do that, okay? And that would be great. And then, secondly, uh, sooner or later, the 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 the, the lecture will only be av available to people who have subscribed. So please make sure you you do that. Encourage your classmates to, to do the subscription. It shouldn't be more than three quarter of a page. It shouldn't be more than three quarter of a page. The assignment I want to give shouldn't be more than three quarter of a page. And uh, it's uh, gastroesophageal reflux, the physiology or the pathophysiology of gastroesophageal reflux. The pathophysiology is the pathophysiology of gastroesophageal reflux. Okay? The pathophysiology of gastroesophageal reflux. It shouldn't be more than three quarter of a page. Okay? And a reference, not a textbook and a a peer-reviewed article, okay? And then I, I remember uh, Samuel is asking me why is, um, sorry, please, why is VIP, why is um, achalasia treated uh, by surgical means and not by administering vasointestinal polypeptide? I, I may only be suggestive, okay? I may only be suggestive from understanding from the fact that probably maybe I don't know if we have exogenous vasointestinal polypeptide as medication. It could also probably mean the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of, of that is not uh, tenable, okay? It's not tenable. But then most of the times it's always a result of the fact that what? There is a deficiency of the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide producing nerves within that area, okay? So there's a possibility that what? There is it, it is a reduction. Okay? It could be due most of the due to a reduction in the number of the VIP containing neurons. In it's more valid. Okay, yeah. So because definitely too. Okay, you know the action of uh, transmitters, isn't it? Where there is a release and a binding to the, its receptors there. Okay, or probably maybe if it's G protein or whatever mechanism it, it, it acts. Okay, so I want to think. The, it's, all, it's always a result of that, that reduction. That's one of, actually, that's the first thing. And so probably maybe given exogenous, I don't know if we have exogenous VIP, I'll find out. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll find out that then I'll give you a concrete action. But then from the physiological understanding and from my own knowledge of pharmacology, I think that that may, and can I please, Repeat the referencing, please. Uh, the referencing, the textbook reference. Don't quote me, Gano, uh, Gaso, Sophia Reflux. Okay, please don't copy and paste. It doesn't help you. Okay, you may, you cannot, you, you cannot outsmart a lecturer. Okay, and I'll give you the modalities of submission. Okay, I'll give you the modalities of submission. So when is the due date of the assignment? I will, to, today is uh, Thursday, so it should be next Thursday. But when I will be giving you the modalities, I'll be able to tell you more. But then it should be next Thursday. Okay, it should be next Thursday. Just not more than three quarters of a page, actually. And let, let's keep it half a page, please. Half a page. Three quarters is becoming a story now. Okay, if you make it three quarter, you are telling a story. Okay, so so far, so good. Any other question? And lest I forget, I'm appreciative of your time. And I hope you enjoy the remaining part of the day and be productive and stay alive by activating the things we discussed at the start of it, okay? So please, um, any other thing I will communicate to you. And lest I forget, please be on the guard. Your exams are on the corner. Okay, somebody says, so did you say achalasia affects the lower third of the esophagus mostly because of the lower esophageal sphincter increased tension? And uh, leading to failure to opening during swaya. Yeah, uh, yes, I think I said so. Yeah, so it is 
uh, characterized by increased tension in the lower esophageal sphincter, uh, difficulty in swallowing, incomplete relaxation of the sphincter, and weak esophageal peristalsis. Okay. Okay. So please, your exams are the comma. And there's a possibility that uh, you remember you didn't do the physiology test one. So we would have to add the components you've covered so far, but you may not need to, to be afraid. But the test one, I remember I printed the questions already for whatever means, but know that you would write an end of terms exams. Whether you write it in the moon, you write it from school, or you write it from uh, from the church, you will still write it. Okay, okay. So, uh, so you would. Um, okay. So somebody is. I'm. I'm sorry for taking the long time so that your bundles got depleted. But then the assignment, it's. Uh, on the gastroesophageal reflux disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, the pathophysiology of it, and just for a half a page and a reference from um, from a peer-reviewed article. Okay, and class rep, if you the, your class reps for the various classes, make sure you summarize the the question, send it to me, then you see if it's the right thing, and then you can share it back to the class. Okay. It's okay, so so I was talking about writing the exam. So it's please be be prepared for it. I remember that the questions are set for your class. There were about six. I don't know. There were sixty questions for multiple choice and short essay. So if it is to be written with cardiovascular, I think uh, Doctor Amambulu would send his own questions, and I will just add to it. I'm not reducing anything. Okay, I'm not reducing anything from what I said before. He will just add to it, so you can you can just imagine. Okay. So every modality for anything, I'm just preparing your mind, however it will be, but then have that at the back of your mind that you will do that. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the day and Maxi.